Hi, this is Jim Janesey, and these are the lecture slides for Chapter 7. In Chapter 7, we're going to be taking a look at Islam, the rise of the Islamic religion in the Middle East in the 600s and 700s, and we'll also be looking at China in roughly this time period, which extends from the Roman era on through the Middle Ages. Let's take a look at Islam first. Muhammad, the prophet of God, received the Quran in about the year 620 to 632. Now that's 600 years after the time of Christ, and the Muslims believe that he received the Quran from the angel Gabriel, it was first carried on as an oral tradition and later committed to writing by some of his followers. One of the things that Muhammad said is that it's impossible to picture God, and God is worshipped without anybody in between you and God. God is referred to as Allah, and because there's nobody to intercede between the individual and God, there are no saints or priests in the Islamic faith. That means you don't have pictures of these to decorate the place of worship, which is called the mosque. In fact, human images aren't even permitted in the decoration of the mosque. Big difference here between Christianity and Islam, you don't need art to tell religious stories. So the mosque is not decorated in the same way that a church is. But the decoration of the mosque consists of these things, geometric patterns and Arabic script calligraphy that spells out God and Muhammad and perhaps verses from the Quran. This is one of the five pillars of the Islamic faith is a pilgrimage to Mecca, which a believer must make one time in their life if they're physically able to do it. And this is really pretty dramatic. In Saudi Arabia, in the city of Mecca, is this large mosque with an open area, and this building is called the Kaaba. It's been there since ancient times. It used to house idols used in the pagan worship, and it's now a venerated site in the Islamic faith. If you take a look carefully here, you'll see these are rows and rows of people, all lined up facing the Kaaba. Mecca is the place where Muslims face when they say their prayers five times a day. This is an Islamic palace in Granada, Spain. The Muslims actually conquered much of the Middle East and all the way up into Spain and almost conquered Europe uh, shortly after the beginnings of the faith. In places that the Muslims occupied, and they occupied Spain for hundreds of years, we see these kinds of decorations on palaces and other buildings. Here's a close-up. You see repeated geometric patterns like this, and all sorts of decoration of that type, instead of any other type of decoration, pictures or, or scenes or landscapes. It's unheard of in Islamic decoration, but very fancy and very ornate geometric images. Now here's a picture, unfortunately I didn't get this into the PDF print, so you'll notice a slight discrepancy there. This does exist in the slide set. I just recently added it because it was kind of an omission that Gombrich doesn't talk about this. Hagia Sophia was built as a church. What you're looking at here is actually the third incarnation of it. The two earlier churches built there as early as 360 AD were destroyed or damaged. And this was built in the middle 500s as a church, a very magnificent church with a huge dome. You can see arches used in the construction here. This is all stone, and it couldn't possibly hold up without the use of this type of an arch. Inside, we see here the dome in this rather recent photograph, but here we see a painting done in 1891 by John Singer Sargent. We'll eventually talk about how this has trappings of the Impressionist era, where things are an impression of things rather than being extremely precise, but if you have a very interesting feeling here, and the coloring being so similar to what a photograph uh, would produce, it would seem that it appeared pretty much to Sargent as it does to us today. Now the technology to build this dome was lost in Western Europe. After the construction of the Pantheon, the art of building a dome like that, that didn't have any support of false work underneath as it was being constructed, was lost in the West. But obviously here, the engineering to produce this dome, and to produce it in a very lasting way, it's suffered through several earthquakes, was still known at that time, at least in this end of the empire. Here's something kind of interesting. When the Muslims took over this whole region in 1453, this church was converted into a mosque. 
the decorations inside that previously existed, decorations uh, such as uh, mosaics of saints, mosaics of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, other holy figures were plastered over because they were not permitted as decorations in an Islamic place of worship. And these kinds of symbols were put up. We'll look in just a second at what this Arabic calligraphy means. This happens to be the name of God, Allah, and this happens in Arabic to be the name Muhammad. So these kinds of things you'll see in the next couple of slides, a very profuse decoration throughout mosques with Arabic script of this variety. And here you can see in Sargent's 1891 painting, the very same medallions hanging there. I'm not pretty sure they were exactly the same ones, but that decoration has been in place for an awful long time. Here's a minaret. In fact, I hadn't mentioned a minaret. These are minarets. When this was turned into a mosque, these were added to the structure. Various other changes have been made in it. The main structure remains as it was when it was a church. A minaret is a tower with stairs inside. A call to prayer is issued by singing it out from here five times a day to call the Muslim faithful to prayer. So minarets are a characteristic of a mosque. This is a minaret constructed in Paris in 1925. And you'll see all this geometric decoration, geometric decoration here carried forth up here and here, very ornate, usually tile, colored tile decoration. And we see here an arch with little arches within, also a way of fancying up part of the structure. Now this is something found within the mosque. It's like a, a little prayer stall called a mirab. And here you see the same kind of colorful tile in geometric patterns. Geometric patterns on the, looks like the terracotta here. This might be especially fancy Arabic script. So keep that in mind. Geometric patterns and Arabic script are what are used to decorate the temple. And there's an outright prohibition on the use of human figures. Any kind of people would not be pictured in any kind of decoration in a mosque. I wanted to give you a little bit of a background here of uh, Israel and Jerusalem in particular. There's a structure in Jerusalem here, the Dome of the Rock, which sits on what's known as the Temple Mount. And I'm outlining the Temple Mount here now. So Jerusalem surrounds this. This is the Kidron Valley. These are all places mentioned in the Bible and Bible stories. This Temple Mount was constructed in the half century before the time of Christ. And it looked something like this at that time. It's a large wall, large stone wall, and filled in earth with various kinds of cisterns and things underneath here. This was a meeting place for the Jewish government, the Stoa. And this was Herod's temple, constructed by Herod, the same Herod you read about in the Bible stories. And the Holy of Holies was right here. This was the holiest place in all of Judaism. Here, Solomon's Sea, that is this large tub of uh, water that we had talked about earlier, and you'll see a replica of that in subsequent chapters, a large cast bronze tub. And various altars where animals were sacrificed existed here, and various courtyards going closer into the temple. Only the high priest could do that. There was a court of the Gentiles where even non-Jews could be in the temple grounds and not necessarily participate in any of the festivities going on there, but at least were permitted to be that close. A number of Gentiles actually had a, a great respect and following for the uh, Jewish faith. Now, what happened was, in 70 AD, the Romans utterly destroyed this temple. All of this was torn apart, stone by stone, and this building was torn apart, stone by stone. And today, what is remaining is this part of the wall and the wall here. And you might have heard reference to the Wailing Wall. That's this portion of the wall here. This Jewish area here includes that. And this, as a part of what the Jews still have access to of Solomon's Temple, is known as the Wailing Wall because prayers are issued forth here. Of course, the Jews recollect the time when all of this was the holiest place in all of Judaism. 